Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm Eric Quanstrom, CMO at Science. And I'm Caroline Maloney. I am the Director of Sales Training and Enablement at Science. I'm kind of pumped about this episode. Uh, we got a chance to meet and talk to Will Allred. I should say, Will the email guy, Allred. And he wears that title, which he gave to himself, which is awesome. Good story. You'll have to listen for it. Because he is the co-founder and COO of Lavender, which is a, a really cool um, sales email app. Uh, AI enabled helps you write better sales emails. Yeah, you guys are going to want to hear this one. He gives away some pretty cool secrets, uh, tricks of the trade, best practices for writing emails and outreach through the email channel. And he also talks about some free offerings for folks who are students or looking for a job. So especially, uh, especially listen out for some of those offerings. Yeah, Will, Will was great. He let us in on a lot of those secrets, which I mean, let's just stop talking and get right to them, shall we? <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do it. Just jumping right into it, um, you know, Lavender is a tool for SDRs to use kind of like all day, every day, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, my shorthand description of it is, you know, we help sellers write better emails faster. And so it's an in-inbox assistant that gives you everything from, you know, recipient insights to a writing assistant, that's probably what we're most known for. Um but it's all kind of baked in with this productivity lens where, you know, we're giving you everything you need um, to write a better email. Yeah. And I, I've noticed something I really admire um, that I think you have posted about recently is uh, offering this for free for folks who are looking for jobs. Um, yeah. That's that's awesome. You know, I, I think that that's a really admirable offering. <laughs> yeah. That, um, that also has roots in how we got started. So we, built this and pivoted into the space. Well, we had a really cool product and we didn't know who we sold it to. So like we didn't have an ideal um, use case when we originally built it. So we tested a number of different markets. My wife had this great idea where, yeah, the time was like, yeah, spring of 2020. So like tons of people out there looking for jobs. Airbnb had just laid off a bunch of folks. And so we're like, well, let's test the job seeker vertical. Um, and just do cold outreach to all these folks that just lost their job and see if they want to use it. Um, so like you can use it for free. And then we just kind of kept that as a policy. Uh, and it's turned out to be a great tool for growth for us, but it's also just like, yeah, teaching people better ways to stand out in the hiring process is rewarding in and of itself. And so did you just recognize that, you know, kind of cold emails to, in, in your case, job seekers was potentially a really viable market? Um, you know, we tested all sorts of markets. We tested recruiting, HR. Uh, yeah, I still remember having conversations with um, like internal HR teams where they had like, you know, multicultural like conversations going and they're trying to use our tone analyzer to like pick up on passive aggressiveness um, <laughs> versus like customer success support. Um, we ultimately ended in sales because salespeople found our product and they started talking about us online and we're like, okay, we should lean into that because these people actually are you know, excited about what we built versus us trying to beat the door down. And so in probably like July, maybe like September is really when we started like laser focusing the product development cycles towards like the sales use case. Um, so like we didn't really have a product built for sales until uh, almost like the start of 21. Interesting. What, what are some of the things that you learned in kind of that sales use case? Once you decided, okay, we're going to pivot there. Everyone's talking about this. It's useful. People are excited. Um, what are some of the things you learned building out kind of that sales use case? Well, some of it's messaging based, right? Like talking about um, recipient insights or like prospect research versus I think our original way that we talked about um, the you know, prospect insights that we have is we refer to it as like caller ID for your email, which like if you get a lot of inbound, it makes a ton of sense. But if you're, you're you know, if you're in sales, your inbox is effectively an outbox. So like that use case isn't necessarily as prominent or um, you're not thinking about that as much. Um, the other piece is probably just like honing in the models towards like a sales use case. 
um, the um, you know, making sure the tone models like picked up on things that mattered to salespeople, um, building out like functions that really mattered to salespeople. So it's like, um, yeah, if you get an email, we'll actually like show you how to respond based on like the tone and like how short or how formal it is because you know, salespeople tend to not like do the mirroring action on like an email or uh, the mobile formatting that we do. So like we're actively monitoring for, is this email written for a mobile uh, use case? Um, Cause like your phone, like mine, probably sitting right here. Um, you're eight times more likely to have your first read through of an email on your phone. Mm -hmm. And so as a sales rep, like you should make sure it's optimized for that. We actually see that like have pretty good impact on response rate. And then also just like building out like integrations into sales tools where sales reps are. So like sales loft and outreach are our native integrations where our product functions the exact same um, on top of those experiences. But we've also now built in like deeper integrations where we can actually take the historic data from those tools and build out like our writing assistant becomes like promoting your best practices back into the organization. That's awesome. I, I, I've heard you speak before to uh, a statistic that indicates that folks really only land on an email for about 11 seconds, you know, an email that they yeah. open. Um, can you, can you speak to, you know, how to, how to best optimize those 11 seconds? Uh, you know, what, what some best practices are that you've, uh, that you've come across with lavender yeah. data? Yeah. So the 11 seconds, what you're referencing really is like how people are reading an, in, like an email. Um, I always like to refer to the entire process though. So like, um, you always have to go back, like a lot of what we try to do is showcasing to the sales rep who typically hasn't had the experience of being a decision maker, getting a bunch of inbound emails. Here's what the other person is experiencing. And so like, instead of stating, like you should write an email that's 25 to 50 words. It's like, they're only going to spend 11 seconds reading your email or the, yeah, the thing that I always talk about is like this inbox triage. Like what's the actual process in which this person goes to their inbox. So they usually land in their inbox and they're looking for names they recognize and threads they recognize. And then there's kind of the sea of everything else that they're trying to like sort and filter through. And so their brain doesn't like, they're not looking to comprehend all the pieces of information. They've got to quickly filter and categorize that. And it's a triage process. And so they look at your subject line and they're like, what is this? And so if you do like Eric dash, yeah. want to increase your reply rates, question mark, they immediately know that you're about to like sell, you're about to pitch slap them as soon as they open that email, right? And so like instead, you know, I always talk about subject lines, like make it boring. Make it two words of just like sales email. It's like one of our best performing subject lines, right? And it just like astounds people that like something so dry would be effective, but it's like um, just talking about whatever it's going to be within the email and not like trying to spruce it up makes it feel like an internal email. And so you pass through this triage layer where they're not like, oh, this person's about to sell me. It's like, oh, what is this about? And then you've got like a more open mindset when they open the email. Um, the other stuff is, yeah, okay. You've gotten them to open the email, right? And they're going to read through it for 11 seconds. They're still not reading for comprehension in an 11 second time window. So there's almost like this um, mental spam filter that's mm -hmm. happening where they're looking for like catchphrases, so like the classic, um, you know, email data from Gong that like people love to reference is interest-based CTAs get twice the amount of meetings as ask for time. And part of that is the friction involved with just like, it's easier to say yes or no versus, well, let me look at my calendar. Well, no, 1130 on Wednesday doesn't work. That's part of it, right? The other part of it is they quickly see, do you have 15 minutes? And they categorize it in their head and they're like, I don't have time for this, right? Or like you go in and you start introducing yourself. You say, hey, I'm Will, one of the co-founders of Lavender. And like people don't normally do that. Um, so there, there's like triggers that like showcase to the person that this is going to be a quote sales email. 
and it could be the best email ever, but they'll never read it. <laughs> and so like the other ones that really matter are um, a little more nuanced. One of them being like the formatting. So like big chunks of text are just kind of intimidating. And on the same topic of big chunks of text, like the length of the email itself, if it just feels like a lot, the, the process is going to be like, nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with that, right? I'll come back to it later. I never do. Um, or it's just like, yeah, it's more than I, I bargained for. It's probably a sales email anyways, right? Um, like uh, man, I've got one example that's just fantastic, which is I agreed to do a workshop for this company. And <laughs> they were like, great, we'll send you a follow-up email. And so I expected like, the company name to be in the subject line. I expected the email to look like a normal, just like short, like, hey, excited to like have you come in, talk about it. The email was just this like really long, I eventually found it, but like it was this really long, like drawn out email. And like the day of they emailed me and they're like, we're really bummed you didn't want to do it, but like, you know, no worries. It's like I never saw your note. And I'm like, oh, we saw that you opened it. And I was like, oh, that was that. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> like the best part was like the whole point was like on inbox triage and I was like you got like triaged and filtered through um which was you know a bummer but it was just like it was a funny like ironic example of like the thing that I was coming to preach you know it was just you know the lesson came slightly too late <laughs> um <laughs> length formatting the other piece is simplicity of the messaging itself um Actually, last piece on formatting before I get into simplicity. Um, so I talked about white space, the amount of text. One of the things that I would love to call out is um, the like using long words. So it doesn't seem like very intuitive to like, you know, the word like opportunity or um, even address and contract, right? Like pretty standard phrases that seem fine, but when you start to stack them together, they eat up white space and they look visually heavy. And that like visual heft is another thing that will like trip that mental spam filter switch. Then um, on that same note, if you start using a bunch of those big words together, um, you'll find that the complexity of the writing rises. Mm -hmm. um, the way that the grade level per um, I always like talk about like most emails are written at or beyond a 10th grade reading level. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, seems great. You're building credibility, whatever you're crushing your response rate though, trying to sound smart because most email replies happen at a fifth grade reading level. And so one of the key things in understanding how that measurement is calculated is it's basically syllables per sentence. And so you want short words and short sentences in small paragraphs where it's really easy to just like capture the information quickly and just state it in its simplest format. You know, it's funny. One of the hallmarks of everything you're describing is salespeople that act a lot like marketers, right? And marketers, as we know, ruin everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say there's one thing that I do like from the marketing side of the house. Uh, there's a couple of things. Like I won't poo-poo marketers too much, but one of the things that marketers do a great job of and salespeople tend to struggle with is creating this like warm, friendly tone. Um, yeah, uh, typically with like younger salespeople in particular, you see this like cold formality, like shine through. And it's because they've been taught their whole life academic writing. And then they come into the sales role and they're told that like, Eric is this big honcho and I got to get a hold of him. And so they lean on those academic roots yeah. to go build that credibility. And so then they come across as like robotic and stiff and weird. Yeah. And so the marketers have actually done a pretty good job of creating that casual formality. Um, so it's something that I find uh, the other side is doing better. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it is funny. You could sum up a lot of your tips as, as having empathy for the person that you're writing to. Um, yeah. you know, I always like to say that SDR work is impossible because most of the time SDRs have never done the job of the person they're writing to. So how could you know, you know, <clears throat> what goes through their mind, right? Like what place, um, <laughs> are most of these people that you're writing to kind of like entering any conversation? 
as such, though, I find it imperative to kind of like remind SDRs like, oh, but by the way, you're talking to the same persona every single day, Mm -hmm. like every single day. So even though you've not done the job, you get to talk to these people and get to know them in a way that, frankly, very few do. That's your unfair advantage oftentimes. Yeah. And like one of my one of my favorite books to encourage to um, SDRs is Winning by Lee Hicks. And all it talks about is just becoming an expert in your space. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Scott Lee references this in um, Addicted to the Process, but it's like, just know your stuff. Um, and like, yes, you haven't had the role, but you know your product. You can talk internally, talk to the CS team, talk to the AEs, talk to other SDRs, try to understand what's the typical status quo. What are they currently seeing in the market that they're trying to use to like solve whatever problems they might have? Uh, speaking of which, understanding what problems you do solve um, and then just talking through, you know, how you actually solve it. Cause like you should be able to distill that down into a conversational format where you could explain it to a kindergartner, mm-hmm. fifth graders. Yeah. Ideal, but yeah, if you can get it down to kindergartner level, even better. I think you said in a LinkedIn post recently, tweetable. I love that. You know, your, your emails should be tweetable. That was my favorite because it's, yeah. it's totally accurate. I love that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun exercise because it's such a harsh um, character limit mm-hmm. that you realize like, what do I have to cut? Um, what do I have to get out of there? But like, you look in like, yeah, I talk to SDRs all the time. I do one-on-one coaching sessions with tons of sales reps. I leave my calendar open on my profile. Um, the, the conversations I'm having are, I get it, but like, no one's ever taught me how to do this. No one's ever taught me email. They'll spend hours teaching me cold calling, but nobody's ever thought to like, sit down and be like, here's how you cold email. And then on the flip side, I talk to managers and they're like, I don't know how, right. It's like, well, I did this and I figured it out. Like, why can't they? And it's like, you figured it out because you've started to learn a lot of these like frameworks that you put into place that you start to utilize, but you're not clear on how to teach those frameworks to other people. You haven't thought through exercises to teach people how to write email. You just give them templates. Um, Big thing I'm focused on this year is just like teaching people that frameworks are way more important than templates. Templates are short-term, right? But if you actually want to be able to like test, experiment, and get better, you have to understand what's actually happening in an email so you can learn what to swap out, what to test. Um, because otherwise you look at A-B testing from like a marketing lens and you're like, oh, I swap out like one word here and I see if it performs better. And you're not actually testing anything. You're just testing a word. You're not testing like this is the angle at which I'm approaching. This is the type of observation that I'm using when I approach somebody, you know, the context of why we're having this conversation. Um, or, you know, here's how I talk about what we do, or here's how I build credibility. Yeah. You can flip different ways of doing those things into your email. You can reorganize them, reposition them to see if that works better. Um, that's like actual A-B testing uh, when it comes to sales messaging. And unless you understand the framework that that template sits on, you know, you're kind of flying blind. Yeah. And along those lines, I'm curious what you think about sort of common email tropes, like the breakup email. Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts on inserting breakup emails at the end yeah. of the <laughs> uh, You might be surprised to hear this. Uh, we use a breakup email. It's our fourth email that we send. And so we do it fast. Yeah. It's like, I'm in here <laughs> and I'm gone. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, we started doing that for a couple of reasons. One, everyone right now is sending really long cadences. Mm-hmm. Everybody's running a marathon. And so we're like, all right, we'll run sprints. Um, like, I'm not going to waste my time. I'll show up. If it's not a relevant reason to be there, I'll be gone. And so we treat cadence design like a hit class where every sprint is designed around a reason for reaching out. Um, we run that sprint and then we're out. Um, and that breakup could be, um, a traditional breakup email. Like ours is something along the lines of like, um, Eric, I'm going to chalk, I've reached out a few times. I'm going to chalk it up to my timing being off. Um, 
Let me know if I'm wrong, but otherwise um, I'm gonna stop my outreach. Right? Super simple, super short, but it's just like, I'm gonna respect your inbox. I'm not gonna keep bothering you. Um, by the way, down from for, for someone for someone that's gotten, I don't know, tens of thousands of cold emails just at science alone, like that exact kind of hit and run is so welcome. And I never get it. Nope. Nope. Well, you get two ends of the spectrum. You get the one-off email that never gets followed up to, or the, um, the cadence that's not threaded, which is also like the funniest thing to me. Hey, did you have any follow like thoughts on my follow-up email? And I'm like, where is it? <laughs> it's just this email in my inbox. Like, where am I supposed to go look? I'm not going to go find it. That's my um, favorite joke too, is when, you know, cold emailers, SDRs, people prospecting you think that you're in it to do their work for them. <laughs> oh man, that's, that's a topic right there. I mean, what you're referencing is um, the right person question mark is the subject line. And then, Hey, Eric, who's the best person to talk to regarding blank? And that's the email. I'm like, that's your job. (laughs) Now, that said, one of the interesting things that I've found is the way in which you can get into that conversation if you're triggering the help instinct in the right way. Mm -hmm. So a good way of thinking about this is like, I, I give people the real world so that they can immediately go to this place where you say something like, Hey, you ever been lost in a foreign city and you went up to somebody and you asked them for directions to the nearest, you know, coffee shop or whatever. And they took a a pause, a beat, they stared you in the eye and then they smacked you upside the head. That's never happened. Right. Right. Like never, ever, ever, because you probably preceded everything that you said to them with, I'm lost. Mm -hmm. I'm new. I don't know the city. I'm guessing you're, you know, someone who might. Right. Like in a sense, like you've given them the homework that you did, even if it was just a random kind of approach as to why you're asking for help. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, And it's something I talk about in cadence design, which is, um, you know, I've come up with multiple ways to describe it, but basically you're reusing your personalization. You've got a reason for reaching out and like people just ditch it at the first sign of no response. Um, that's why we run short cadences. That's why we, uh, basically, you know, uh, design them around a singular reason for reaching out so that when we're at any stage in the, you know, the cadence, I can reference why I'm there. Mm-hmm. I give them context. Like, you know, given your hiring for sales reps, I assume this would be top of mind, right? Or, uh, maybe it's something like, you know, Given your you know, past experience as an individual contributor, I imagined you'd been thinking about this, or I suspected you'd been thinking about this, looking at ways to improve this setup, something like that. Um, right, but like the, the language is always like, there's context for why I'm here. I'm not just randomly showing up and asking, um, doing your homework, showing your work, right? It improves, uh, extremely valuable. That was actually, we've been working on some product stuff where we're trying to get into the realm of uh, automating some of the personalization. Um, And our engineers were really good at figuring out how to like take problem statements and like tie them back into value props. I was like, that's super cool. You did the hard part. Now you just have to show your work, (laughs) right? Like they forgot the part where it says, I saw on blank. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like you miss the context that like set up that conversation. Um, but it's cool that you figured that part out. <laughs> well, and it's funny, some of our other podcast guests, in fact, more than one, have actually said context is king, um, even over and above content, which I think I agree with all day long, twice on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it just you think about the way the brain processes information, right? You are we're going to get into like the science now, right? Which is you are essentially in a state of fight or flight when you're in your inbox. You are filtering through, triaging through this information. You've got a hyperactivated amygdala. You are ready to bounce at any sign, right? Um, Like phrasing, like, I know you're super busy. Brain immediately says, yep, I am. Bye. Gone. Um, Or hope this finds you well. Oh, it's a sales pitch now. 
I mean, there's just stuff that like the brain just like fires. It's like, nope, not doing it. Um, the context helps set up the brain to be receptive to everything that you're going to say afterwards. I was like, oh, okay. Now I understand why this person reached out. I understand why this is about to happen. And because of that, I'm here to listen to it. Um, I tell people a similar thing when they're, you know, pitching a case study, which is like, hey, check out this case study you did with such and such. No one's going to click through. It just doesn't happen, right? Um, there's like two pieces of that. One, as sellers, we should be more thoughtful about that. We shouldn't send like random hyperlinks because, you know, you could be some hacker across the world sending random email. And so don't promote that behavior. Um, two, the, uh, the idea that we think that they're actually going to do that for us and to opt in. And so we can actually set up the case study as a story and create context, you know, provide a narrative. We can make them feel like they're not the only ones doing certain things. Um, so like the way I, I typically write out like a case study is I'll use two to three sentences. Um, and I'll use a framework that people use in job interviews, BAR, which is I provide background, the actions taken and the results found, right? And so that allows me the freedom to say things like, um, yeah, they hadn't, you know, this other company hadn't done this thing either because they thought this would be true. We proved to them that it was wrong. Uh, we proved to them that, that assumption was wrong. And that way I'm not showing up and being like, your baby's ugly, <laughs> you know, where it's like people will just start off an email and be like, yeah, did you know you're doing this wrong? It's like, do you know I think about this all the time? And right. you just showed up in my inbox assuming that I don't. Um, now I hate you and never talk to you again. Bye. Right. That's exactly it. And you know, what's funny about case studies too. I've found this to be true. Kind of like the world over back to the marketers again. Um, they're always light on the background and they're always light on the context of what were the people that hired you or hired your product thinking when they were buying, because you know what, that's the important part to relate back to somebody that you're introducing a new product, new service to. Yeah. What were they thinking? Your peers, the lookalikes, the folks that, you know, you would just as soon say, in my case, hey, Eric, want to know what other CMOs are up to when it comes to this particular like area of promise? Because I would normally go, nah, don't care. Yeah. Like yeah. never. There's a, there's I always want to know. Yeah. It's a framework I used with a, a company in the hiring space that was using... Oh man, I remember this now. Um, They're using Facebook ads to help people fill open roles. And I was working with them on their email content. And there was this really interesting like angle that we figured out we could approach people with, which was essentially like relatability. Um, yeah, like, hey, Eric, when you're scrolling on Instagram, um, yeah, I imagine... Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what the phrasing was. Basically, I like lined it up to like, oh, it was, do you ever feel like the ads are just like creepy with how like sharp they are? Um, yeah, you wouldn't be the first person to tell me they've bought um, a couple things off Instagram. Um, we use that same ad algorithm to help you fill jobs. Want to learn how we do it. It's like very simple way of stating what you do, but now I've set context. That's like, yes. Okay. Got it. Interesting. Tell me more. Right. And voila, you've opened up a conversation now that could lead to a sale. Yep. Yeah. I was telling uh, Eric before you hopped on, Will, uh, someone today sent me a personalized meme in Cold's outreach on LinkedIn, which was really cool. No one's ever done that before. I loved that. Yeah. And it kind of was this perfect blend of content and context because the content was spot on. I had been commenting on this meme, you know, on LinkedIn, they had clearly seen that. And yeah. the context was there too. It was personalized to me. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, media within an email, like GIFs, videos, memes, pictures, like what are, what are your yeah. thoughts on some best practices there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, 
I don't think my opinions here have made me many friends because um, I try to avoid them um, personally because like I stick by that like notion of pattern matching where it's like if something with a video shows up in my inbox, who sent me a video other than a sales rep? When's the last time you got an internal video, right? Right. <laughs> other than like something from your CEO, maybe that was like cringeworthy. And you're like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> the company announcement, <laughs> right? But um, to that, I know that people use them. I know that they work. And so like, by all means, keep going with it. If it's working for you, go with it. Um, I prefer to use things like video and voice memos in a platform like LinkedIn, as opposed to um, like Gmail. One of the reasons is like you can actually natively put the video in um, and use the camera phone, which or the camera on your phone, which is a much higher quality camera than the one on your computer usually. Um, the um the other media assets like yeah you know, with lavender you can like insert gifts into your email gifts work uh it just does um the yeah the meme idea like we're visual people right and so if it helps you orchestrate or illustrate your point much faster um like i mentioned that breakup email like we'll throw a gif in there and it works better when we put a gif in there um, because it can basically state everything that you're trying to state faster. Um, and so if you think about that 11 second window, I just think about like, does it line up with the context? Does it accomplish what it is that you were trying to set out at the beginning? So like think about like using a GIF in a breakup email. I'll keep on that example. If your GIF is like overly pleading or like, um, passive aggressive or like weird, right? It might not have the same results as, you know, like SNL Elizabeth Warren just being like, is it a bad time? And like <laughs> picking up a like hand phone. And like that's much simpler. Doesn't have the same like subtle undertones that like would drive somebody not to respond. And so it works better. Well it's because silence is the enemy, isn't it? In any inbox interaction, right? Like at the end of the day, I think that every SDR using any channel what they want more than anything is engagement. Yeah. I well, and, and let yeah. me iterate, like, you know, I think video can be really impactful for just showing that you are a real person. I think there's thoughtful ways you can line it up within your cadence so that you're not um, struggling with scale in your outreach because it does take time to put those together. And so that's why I've seen a lot of teams leaning on voice memos instead as like a faster way to get content out there because you're not worried about what you look like, where your hair is at, and you know, do you look like a weirdo reading a script? You can just like talk. Um, the um, uh, and, and video is the same thing, right? I, I like it within um, like a larger cadence because you know, similar to using multi-channel, it adds more proof to the fact that you are actually a real person trying to reach out. Um, so that, that's like my, my final thought on video. So real quick, joining a few things together, you know, I imagine with lavender, you know, GPT three is probably at the heart of everything that you're using. And, you know, if successful, um, you'd already mentioned it, you know, automation is kind of like in our future and you're probably designing or thinking about things that can be automated to the high heavens. Proving that you're a real person, on the other hand, is kind of like the struggle, if you will, and the struggle is real. Um, talk to me about your view of, of like a future that has both Lavender and SDRs being individuals really successful. Yeah, um, I don't think of them as mutually exclusive. And if you think about why the SDR role exists, it's for efficiency sake. Yeah. So um, if we become a tool that helps with you know, making the prospecting process more efficient, you know, you're gonna start to see that more organizations move towards a full cycle sales role where the person can manage the inbound from those prospecting efforts and they can move them through to close. And like you're seeing this now with a lot of like PLG companies um, or as well as just like marketing led companies 
like uh, Shopify, for example, they don't have SDRs. They've, or they might have SDRs now, but I know for quite some time they were just full cycle wraps. Um, it makes sense, right? They've got the brand that brings most people inbound. And so it's mostly like a, you know, just closing them kind of conversation or um, like I know the SDRs over at Dooley, uh, which is a, a software company for sales folks as well, um, focused on like CRM updates and efficiency. Like their sales reps are closing deals, uh, not just opening them. And so like there's something to be said for that efficiency and the fact that they can drive that conversation that fast. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out with other types of software companies. Do they try to adapt, create more like freemium style models? You know, PLG is basically freemium. We just give it a different name. So it sounds cool. Um, Pass it up a little. <laughs> yeah, right. Passing it up a little. No, it's more strategic this way. <laughs> um, a lovely buzzword that means nothing. Um, <laughs> because no one wants the term freemium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It got bad connotation. Um, but you know, product led sales, you know, all sorts of stuff, but, um, yeah, I think there's, yeah, something to be said for, um, cracking the code on that efficiency. Um, yeah, regardless, I still think there will be plenty of companies out there that rely on the SDR motion. It's just, it, it can't like completely outsource that, um, and with that, like, we'll be that helpful tool that ensures that they're doing their job as efficiently and effectively as possible. You know, we view everything we do in two lenses, which is, you know, faster and better. So um, pivoting a little bit, your LinkedIn profile calls you the email guy. I think you've more than demonstrated exactly why. Where'd that nickname come from? Oh man, I, I literally just made that up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I saw it trending on Twitter where people were joking about like the blank guy on like people's profiles. And I was like, nobody's doing this on LinkedIn. I'll just do it for fun and see if like it takes off or sticks. Um, and then nobody said anything. So I just left it there. You're the first person to bring it up. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Funny. yeah. Well, you know, self-proclaimed anything is, um, is interesting and memorable, I might add. Um, for anyone that, you know, talks to, so now when we go back and, you know, people in the re-listen for this podcast, will say, Will Allred, the email guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny, man. I, um, I don't actually claim to be better at email than other people. Like I just jumped off a call with someone who was telling me all sorts of stuff that he's doing to like scale up, like personalized outreach with like cool screenshots and stuff that like I hadn't even thought of. So like, I'm certainly not the best emailer on the planet. I just happen to be more thoughtful about it than most people. And I publish about it publicly. What are, what are some of the best ideas that you feel like you've learned since becoming a bit of a subject matter expert from prolific publishing um, all the time? Um, I think publishing has required me to actually think through it's, it's sort of taking me on that process of going from template to framework, right? Where I'm thinking through like, okay, well, why is that where it is? What's the purpose of that thing? And so when you ask those, like, uh, I can't call it those soft gloves, just like too cheesy. Uh, <laughs> when you ask these like questions about what you're writing, um, the, yeah, you, you bring yourself into, you know, thinking about it from a different angle, I'd say. Um, which I think that's been one of the cooler things. Um, one of the other cool things about publishing is just like, you know, seeing how other folks are approaching it because people always love to share stuff with me, like what they're building, um, how they're approaching it, how they've thought through, you know, something that I've published and like taking it and putting their own spin on it, which then gives me more ideas for, you know, how it could be done. Um, and then, um, yeah, with that, it's also like super rewarding to, to see folks, yeah, you know, use things that you put out there and, um, yeah, you know, adapt it into their own style and have success. You know, one of the coolest things about my job is when folks are like, "Oh, I needed this job," or like, "I got this meeting booked," like from our conversation, like that's so cool. Um, so that's the the gratitude part of the job, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. What kind of feedback do you guys get on um, on lavender that you're really enjoying right now? Um, feedback that we get on lavender, man. Um, they fall into three buckets, and it really focuses around three like staples of the product, which is I'd say the coaching dashboard. We've been getting a ton of feedback there recently around like, hey, can your product do this? Hey, can it do that? Um, you know, I really like it for the following reasons, but like, I would love just like this deeper, yeah, X, Y, and Z. Um, that stuff to me is always like fascinating because it's like, um, you know, as a company, we're starting to move now from one player mode into multiplayer mode where it's now a team product. Um, we've had tons of success with teams, like think about Sendoso, for example, where, you know, great email organization doing great things. They came in started a trial with us and we 4 X their response rates. And it's because we were able to pull in all the insights from across those inboxes and tell them what they needed to do better. Um, and so like, there's a cool factor to be had for like what comes with that, like with pulling all those insights from multiple inboxes that like gets me jazzed about my day to day. Um, then on like the, the one player mode the feedback we get, yeah. Um, you know, questions around like what's possible with like writing automation, what's possible with like the recipient research that we can help with, um, you know, uh, same story around like recommendations where people are like, this is really helpful, but it'd be helpful or more helpful if, you know, like um, one of the questions we always get is like, you guys make writing suggestions for like complicated sentences and stuff. like. Uh, it'd be great if you could give me a couple suggestions so I could think through uh, some different ways to write this as opposed to just getting one option. And so like the next version that's rolling out in a couple of weeks, we'll just promote multiple options, which like seems very simple, but um, A, it gets us more bats to get it right. And B, it offers opportunity to coach and actually start getting people to think um, you know, one of the key things that's made our product successful is salespeople are actually thinking about what they put out and they're actually putting a critical lens on it. It's crazy just how um, the design of the product encourages that. You know, you write a mobile unoptimized sentence and we flag it and we're like, hey, that was not mobile optimized. It's like, oh, let me look at it. And then all of a sudden they're thinking about it. They're like, oh, you know what? That's actually just a better way to phrase that, right? It's like, yeah, through awareness, we've been able to drive some pretty cool things. That's awesome. It's almost like you have a little mental prosthetic or a Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder watching what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's the, uh, and people have actually mentioned that with like uh, COVID, right? You used to just like turn around the office and be like, how does this look? Like, how am I doing? And that's now become like, where we sit it's like you know you're that objective third-party lens to give me some feedback do you have any plans to you know integrate lavender's tool onto platforms like linkedin or uh you know the text channel kind of move away from having it just focus on email suggestions and edits yeah um linkedin is on our uh, radar the problem with linkedin though is it's not an open api and so our ability it never will be. To, yeah. And so our ability to like get smarter and do better is pretty limited. Um, and if everybody used LinkedIn on their desktop, it wouldn't be that big of an issue. We'd be able to figure out like how to capture that info. Um, but it's you know 50 50 on phone and on the computer. And so with that, there's like huge data holes that make it pretty hard to like optimize and get better. Um, so we're always looking into that though. Um, and like, even if we figured out, like, even if we just provide like a lightweight version of our product, it still adds a ton of value into that process. And so, um, it's on our roadmap where that falls as far as priorities, yeah, fluctuates. <laughs> um, I think that we're getting uh, to the place in the podcast where, those that have been listening and, and kind of like basking in the glow of, of the insights that you've shared, well, would want to maybe learn more either about Lavender or about you. 
Um, you've already kind of indicated that you're wide open and help people all the time. Um, care to share where people can reach you? Yeah, um, I always encourage folks to connect with me via LinkedIn. Um, yeah, they can always email me and I'm, I'm helpful there too. Um, I just have uh, resources outlined in my bio on my LinkedIn that might um, you know, soften some of the inbound where you know, they can go check out my newsletter, they can um, download the product, they can uh, schedule one-on-one -on -one time with me, all sorts of things. So multiple options um, on one page. Awesome. Well, we've really appreciated this conversation. So thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate y'all uh, inviting me to come chat and you know, sharing what I'm working on with uh, y'all's audience. So thank you. Yeah.